Hi, this is Michael Williams. We're ready for another series. We hope you've enjoyed the last two that Randy French has uh, produced for us right here from the Sound Laboratory in Grand Haven, Michigan. Uh, this is uh, really a wonderful experience to be able to do this and to be able to share these videos with you. Please let us know what you think about them. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent is uh, it's irrelevant. We just simply want to hear from you. Please let us know what you think. Uh, we're going to another subject now. We've taught you about perfection. We've taught you about uh, predestination. And now we're going to teach you on the subject of faith. Now, the subject of faith really is a uh, wonderful uh, subject, but there's something wrong in Christianity <laughs> with the subject of faith. And let me say right out of the gate here, I'm not trying to trick you into watching this video. If someone has told you you have to be, have faith to be saved, they've told you something that's not true. They've told you something that is not what Paul had to say about the subject. That is for sure. So if Paul had something different to say about it, let's look and see. And then let's examine at least a piece of the most um, uh, prevailing teachings on the subject of faith. And you're going to find out exactly what that is. Here in the book of Galatians, we find out that Paul had a very strong opinion and an experience with faith. But I want you to compare it to the experience you were taught that you were to have with faith. So let's look at this. It's found in Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 19. Now, for those of you that know that we always teach in context, believe me, we've taught the entire book of Galatians in context, but for the sake of keeping these videos to 15 minutes or so each, we don't want to try to take in the entire book, but instead show you something that we've studied out in context what this is actually saying or what it just says. It's not what it actually says. It's what it says. So as we look at this, uh, read with me. If you have a Bible there, you can open it up. Otherwise, uh, we're just going to read through this. Now, the first statement, uh, I was going to start in verse 20 in Galatians chapter uh, 2, 20, because that focuses on the subject ex uh explicitly and exclusively. But then as I started reading, I keep going back. And I know if I do what I normally do, I'm going to keep going back and adding another verse, another verse, another verse to try to get this to uh, uh, be more in context. But we're going to start with verse 19. And Paul made this statement in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Have you ever heard that before? Paul said he was dead to the law and being dead to the law is the only way he or you or anyone else can live unto God. Have you heard somebody tell you that they're living unto God or living for God uh, and by trying to keep God's law, have you ever heard that? Yes, of course you've heard it. You hear it all the time. Then Paul is either mixed up or he's got something to say here. I think Paul has something to say. <laughs> For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Wow, that's a mouthful. You know, we could stop right there and stay on this probably for several hours just to make this a uh, powerful comparison about this reality that living unto God means you must be dead to the law. Now, you can't live unto God and be have a relationship with God's law. It's either God or his law. 
Ah, I know what just happened to your head. (laughs) You thought God's law is God, but it's not. God gave his law, but the law was never given for you to be made righteous. The law was actually given to help us understand that there is no way that you can have a relationship with God through the law. That's why these things always turn out to be a disaster. And somebody does something really uh, freaky and really crazy trying to keep God's law. Now, Paul makes this statement then following here on this subject. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, Paul said that the only way he lives unto God is outside of the law, and the only way he lives is in Christ. And he says, that's not even really me, but it's Christ that's carrying out this lively relationship with God. Because in, in a relationship with God, it is not us in any obedience to God's law that is uh, governing our position or our relationship with God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I never will forget seeing this for the first time, even though I stumbled through (laughs) reading it there for you. Uh, I remember reading through this the first time, and the question coming to me, why does Paul get to live by the faith of the Son of God, and I have to live by my own faith? What's up? Paul, did you have something special that I don't get? Or is this something that you had what the entire world is supposed to live by? Are we supposed to be living by the faith of the Son of God? Or are we supposed to be living by our faith? Paul said, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me tell you, you want to experience God's love, study predestination. You want to experience God's love? Start living your life by the faith of Christ and forget yours. Because I'm going to give you a little revelation here. You don't have any anyway. You say, Mike Williams, how could you have the audacity to tell me I have no faith? Well, Jesus proved you don't. (laughs) Jesus said, if you had faith, Even the size of a grain of mustard seed, the smallest seed of all seeds on the planet. If you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you would be able to do what? Say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, I have never once in my life seen nor heard of a mountain going flying through the air headed for the sea. According to Jesus, you know, we talk about in the Word of Faith movement, we talked about having uh, baby faith and, uh, you know, uh, uh, intermediate faith and adult faith and giant faith and great big faith. But the fact of it is Jesus said that the smallest amount of faith Faith is so powerful that if you had any at all, you would be able to say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and it would obey you. Now, Jesus was standing there not saying, oh, well, I'm talking about problems. Jesus obviously was pointing at this mountain and saying, This mountain, this one, not one in your uh, imagination that has been created by some preacher who came to town that say, well, this is a mountain in your life. Well, that's one way to look at it. But the uh, fact of it is, is Jesus was looking at a physical mountain and said, if you had any, if you had any. Man, now you're wondering, Michael, what am I going to do if I have no faith? Well, you live by his faith, 
And that's where the freedom of the gospel kicks in on the subject of faith. Now, you've heard the freedom of the gospel on the subject of perfection. You have heard the freedom of the gospel on the subject of predestination. Now you're going to hear the gospel on the subject of faith. I would say the things you're going to hear you've never heard before. If you have, please write and let us know. Please get on our website, gospelrevolution.com, and send us an email and say, oh, uh, Mike, I, I, I'm telling you, I went to this service and this preacher was teaching on this subject that is that faith is not a human quality. It is a God characteristic. And the requirement of faith on the human race was proven that it could not be done. Now, the term faith and the word belief are exactly the same Greek word. So we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that where the issue of faith or belief is concerned, that it was required. I'm going to save that one for you. I'm already getting into some things that I really wish that I could do just a little bit uh, ahead of time, but I don't want to leave things in a confused state. Let's, let's read through this in its entirely entirety. Um, Paul then said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now, if you are trying to live by your own faith under God's law, you are frustrating the grace of God. Because Paul said this is what was absent from his life, and Paul is now saying this is what keeps him from frustrating God's grace. I do not frustrate the grace of God. And if you're trying to live by your faith, you say, but Mike, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Could that be Christ's faith that pleased God? You had to be perfect before God to be accepted by God. So if, if, is this perfection something that you do, or is this perfection something that God himself has done? I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, Christ is dead in vain. Man, that's a powerful statement. That if you get righteousness out of obeying God's law, Paul says that Christ is dead in vain. Now, I have to just uh, show you this small part also. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, this is chapter 4, verse 2, uh, that if you be circumcised and obedience to the law, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you obey the law for righteousness, Christ will profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he's a debtor to do the whole law. So if you keep one law, you are debtor to keep it all. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by God's law, you're fallen from grace. Now, I know you've heard the term fallen from grace. I remember when Jim and Tammy Faye uh, got caught in a scandal, uh, and then uh, Jim went to, to jail. Now, he's back on TV now uh, declaring that hurricanes are God's voice telling you that he's mad uh, about something. I didn't even listen long enough to figure out what Jim Baker decided that God was mad about. Uh, but here, when we heard that about Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, they even produced a film about them, uh, a Hollywood video. And it, do you know what the title of it was? Fallen from Grace. So what did Jim and Tammy Faye do to fall from grace? According to Christianity, they broke God's law. But what does Paul say here? Paul said, number one, I do not frustrate the grace of God because if righteousness comes through the law, Christ is dead in vain. You make a mockery of Christ by saying that you have some advantage with God by keeping God's law. Do you have an advantage with God by keeping his law? Not at all. In fact, if you're keeping it trying to make sure that you're right with God, you're at a disadvantage. 
so disadvantaged that Paul said Christ becomes of no effect. Whoever of you that are justified, not those of you who break God's law, but those of you who are justified by God's law, you have fallen from grace. So how did Paul live? He lived by the faith of God. How did he express it? He embraced the fact he was completely dead to God's law so he could live unto God and live by the faith of Christ. You want freedom from your own faith? I got freedom from my own faith, and I'm telling you it is a blessed freedom. A blessed freedom to be free from faith, to be freed from faith. Just like being freed from the law, being freed from sin, it's all the same thing. Are you in bondage to faith? Are you in bondage to having to live your life by your faith? Or do you have the wonderful understanding that Paul had that you live by the faith of the Son of God? <laughs>